All right. Hey, it tells you now it, there's an audio cue. That's it does. new to me. Okay. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Well, welcome to Rigorously Relevant. Um, this is the talk show. I know I'm supposed to say podcast because that's like modern, but when I was growing up, talk shows were like the big thing and everybody wanted to be like Oprah. So this is my talk show. So welcome to my talk show. And this morning we have Stephen Cumming and I am super excited about that. So thank you for getting up early to do this. Oh yeah, no, my pleasure. <laughs> so why don't we just jump right in? We've been having a really good conversation before the conversation, so we're good. we're kind of warmed up. But why don't you start us off with um, how you came to social work and what that means to you? Yeah, long story, uh, aren't they all? I'll, I'm trying to think of the best way to edit it down because I didn't think about social work as a field of anything. Uh, you know, before we started, I was talking about how I've had this relationship with the university that I currently work at uh, since the late 80s. And that's a, that's a bit of a stretch because I literally became a freshman or a first year student in 1989. And at the time I had a general thought process of, I want to get into, you know, at the time we weren't using the phrase, at least I wasn't using the phrase social justice, but socially responsible work. And so I wasn't too interested in doing something that wasn't that. So I focused on education. I was actually going to be follow in my aunt's footsteps and be an elementary education you know, teacher, maybe an administrator, who knows. And I wanted to focus on what was the concept, the, the, the general category of special education. I have my own history with that. And so focused on that and graduated in 94, went overseas. My, uh, so my wife Sherry and I, we married right before we graduated in 94, like one year before that. And when I met her, she, as we were going out, she said, you know, just to let you know, I'm studying Asian languages and literature. I'm going to stu- I'm, I'm focus on Japanese. And my, my big plan is to move there at least for a while. I said, that's great. And of course, being a capricious young man, I'm like, can I go with? That sounds like a lot of fun. And uh, we did. Actually, we did it. We, we actually applied for what's known as the Japanese exchange teaching program, still around. And uh, that's a big, bit of a plug. We went there. And uh, we both got accepted to it, I should say. We didn't just go. You have to go through this process. Uh, There's not enough time in this this, this recording for me to go into all of that. But uh, we had to do a live interview. Then we waited and we waited. And we finally got the letter. Because in 94, there was no email to send anything to us. Everything was like, is the the mail here? Is the mail here? And got it. We both got in and got to live in Japan for three years. Now, why am I telling you all of that? Other than it was a fun thing for us to do. It was very meaningful and it was a learning experience for me to be away from here somewhere else in the world. And that's where the roots are for me of, of social work, because I, that's where that came from. So that's where I, I, didn't, I still didn't have the phrase social work in my brain at that moment. When I was in Japan with Sherry, I actually was deployed to teach at various English schools in the area. We were in Fukushima Prefecture. One of the schools was the school that was known as the School for the Blind. And they needed English teachers there. And as I was there, um, I noticed that it wasn't just people who were, you know, without sight. There were all sorts of folks there with different uh, things that they were, uh, you know, different challenges, whatever. And one of the instructors there said, you know, it's, it, it, we don't really have a policy or system for folks in Japan. So anybody who's blind, maybe they have a hearing loss, maybe they have a physical, you know, maybe they can't, maybe they're, they're paraplegic, for example, or have other issues. They all come here because this is the only thing we have for them. And that really got my wheels turning because I thought, well, that's interesting for all sorts of reasons. We came back and I worked for an agency here in Iowa City for people with disabilities. And it was my supervisor at that time who was a, not only a social worker, she was a graduate of the master's program and she was working towards her advanced clinical licensure. And we just happened to be driving to a, a, a site where we had some job coaching going on. And she said, let me tell you all about it because what you're telling me fits with everything I just did. And I think you'd be great at it. And that's all. And that's where I got it. You know, I, I, I was planning on going to graduate school. I didn't know what I was going to study. And she said, let me tell you what you should do. And this is what you should do. Got in at University of Iowa, got my master's degree in 2002. That's it. That's how I got into it. Really cool. That's a very cool story. And where in your journey did you start to discover research? So research came as part of actually being in the program. Uh, I, I, did have the roots of, I, I mean, when I did the study and the, and the preparation for going into the graduate program, obviously I looked at the courses and the courses include research one and two. The University of Iowa is, is what is known as a research one institution. So they make a big deal out of it, right? And 
for me at that point already, I was aware of how policy and program development decisions were being made at the agency level where I worked. And that we, and one of the first things I helped do was set up a, a place to collect data on, a, on a, using software, which for this agency, which was very, you know, bare bones, they didn't have much of anything in terms of a, a infrastructure for that. So I learned literally what I think of as the ground up is like, well, we need to know what our outcomes are. We aren't just doing nice things. We need to know, is this making, is this efficacious? Is it meeting the needs of the public? Are, are, you know, are the client, is the time the consumers was still a term being used in the uh, late eighties, early nineties. I do believe we're no longer using that term, but uh, there was an understanding that we needed to know if we were meeting the needs of the people that we were working with. And we can't just think that we are, we have to do it somewhere where it's a little more rigorous than that. And I know that as somebody who is in their mid to late twenties, we should already know things like what is rigor? What is data? How does that get interpreted? What is your research question? You know, I didn't have a course at that point. I just had this experience of being in an agency where people might come in going, I'm going to do something nice. And I'm just being, you know, no bliss oblige, but the agency is like, no, we have nothing to do with that. What we have is a need in this, in this uh, community that was identified by at that time, parents who had children who had needs and they needed to have good outcomes for their children. So that's how I got into it. I'm like, oh yeah, this is a real thing that needs to be addressed from a research perspective. So when I got into the program, there were, there was a sequence of two semester courses on research. And that's how I really got into it. And yes, as a, and to this day, I have students, I just had a seminar yesterday where students were like, everything's going great, but I'm really terrified about that research class. And I always like to tell them about this, like think of it from this perspective. Think of it from the perspective because you wouldn't want somebody to make adjustments or decisions based on what they think is best for you. Research is a lot like that. You know, if we're really going to do actual change, we have to have some sense of what the world is asking and what we understand the world to be and not just some subjective opinion. I really love this answer because my perception is that far too often on the agency level, um, there, there's really not a lot of research going on and that um, people aren't really looking at outcomes and that honestly, social workers are being discouraged from doing that type of work. So I think that's, uh, do you think I'm wrong in that, that that's kind of unusual? I think it's, I, you know, I think, I think there's a lot of discussion about the forces that allow agencies to exist in the first place. So at the time that I was working at this agency, they were beholden to funding or, you know, support through Medicaid, Medicare, and other types of uh, waiver resources through the, through the state system. So you have to meet their needs, right? So whatever you're doing, you have to meet those needs. And I think that sometimes there's a lot of concern about a lack of innovation as a result of that. Yeah. Now you can go back and forth on that and talk about where does the innovation actually lie. And I try to get away from the concept that only private industry does innovation or only public innovation. You know, I, I, tend, I tend not to think that way. But I do think there are forces that work against doing true measurement of outcome. The agency that I worked with had to change its policy in order to get resources of support because uh, in the course of the time that I was there, there was a shift in focus of how people with disabilities should be doing this versus that. What, what's the program we need to do? I'm being really generalistic, partly because it was a while ago and I don't wanna misremember, but I do remember the shift in how we can't get funding until we do these things. So that sometimes gets in the way of measuring outcomes, but there was still a focus on outcomes. And that was probably because the agency wanted to go back to the public and say, hey, stakeholders, we, this is what we're doing. We need to hear from you some more. Uh, we need to put you in the center of this conversation. But here's what we've done based on what we've been uh, assessing over time. So that, that's, again, what you know, triggered for me. But I think you're absolutely right that there may not necessarily be an encouragement for research. And actually, I'll tell you this, too. When I, when I graduated and I went into what I wanted to do next, was, which, which was to be a hospital social worker. So I was like, I wanted to work towards clinical focus in a hospital setting. And I got that. We have, a, we have a trauma one center here in Iowa City, and I worked there for about 10 years. And one of the cool things about being on campus, every, everything's on campus. And what, was, what I always think is neat is that we had this medical campus on the one side of the river, and we have the social work program as part of the university on the other side of the river. And so we'd have students come in. So I took on the role of an instructor uh, for a number of years. And I would have students ask me, can I do some research data collection as part of my research program? Which I thought, yeah, let's, let's talk about that. I was shut down from that almost immediately from the upper administration at the hospital. Like, you don't have time for that. Your roles are this, this, and this. You're not a researcher. You're a clinician. So you can see how the divide was created. And even though I was making the case that we'll go through the process, I'll spend time on this, you know, in service to the profession. You know, I've had that, you know, there's a model for that, or there's a, there's a way of thinking about that. 
that I was trying to encourage. Like, I really want to do this. I, I derive some pleasure out of it or some, some meaning out of it, but I was just completely discouraged from it. So when you say, yes, are social workers discouraged? I think absolutely they're discouraged. I don't think all, I, I have not done a survey of all agencies, but I can tell you, I was certainly, you know, your role is not that. Your role is this. This is what we pay you for. And it was discouraging. And it may have something to do with why I eventually left there to come over to uh, the School of Social Work as a, as a faculty member. Yeah, I feel that's such a disservice to everybody, to the community and to the social work profession and academia. So I really, I hate hearing that, but it seems to be the more common story. So how do you think we can start to change that? That's a good question too. Uh, I think, you know, it's, it, I, I mentioned something there that I wasn't being paid or I wasn't being accommodated for that time. That's a big part of it. It's a lot to ask any clinician in the field to do work beyond that clinical work. I mean, just to take a student on as a, as a, as a person in, a, in an internship or a practicum, because as you know, you know, there's a whole discussion right now. There's a whole movement to go, you know what? Maybe this isn't ethical to bring people in and just have them do internships for free or practicum work for free. And I think on top of that too, it's hard, it's hard on instructors too. It's hard on instructors to carve out that time to do the nurturing. We do it. We have a system that really enforces it right now. But I think that also speaks to why it's difficult to engage in research across the spectrum. Now, having said that, I don't want to dismiss the fact that there are clinicians that I know in their practice who do, you know, kind of A, B, pre-post evaluations of the work they're doing on the ground, partly to see what works and what doesn't. And that falls into the realm of a kind of research model, even though they're not necessarily publishing it. And then there are those that do. So I don't want to sit here and say no one's doing it and there's this untenable like divide that no one can cross. Mm -hmm. uh, it happens, but it's just difficult. And there's and uh, I will say that I think more to the point, I think what the struggle is, I do believe that there is a there is a clear connection between what happens with these programs like ours, uh, our accredited programs, and what happens in the field. And there needs to be a deeper relationship between the two. Mm -hmm. And sometimes what frustrates me the most is when I have students who either have the attitude like I don't really need what the school is giving me, I just need to get through it so I can get that license and go out into the field and I will never think about it ever again. Or we get instructors in the field who occasionally will kind of suggest or lead to, to, the, to that thinking. That's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. And there are ways that schools need to improve. I think I should also say that there are ways that schools need to do better. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not here to, to say that schools are doing it right and practitioners are doing it wrong by no means. Um, but there is a way to bridge that divide. If you go to my LinkedIn page, this I'm laughing because I'm, I, if you look at any of my social media presence, like Twitter or LinkedIn, I always have this picture of a bridge. And that bridge represents that. Because on campus at University of Iowa, there is the Iowa River flows right through. And on the west side is the hospital. It's the medical campus. And on the, on the other side is the general liberal arts and sciences campus. And I think that bridge is important because you know, a lot of our social workers are employed over there. And so when they cross the bridge back and forth, you know, that's a symbol of that. It's the idea that we're, we're working together in a meaningful way. I love that symbol. I love that idea. Yeah, and I, I definitely agree there needs to be more of that um, so we can move forward in the profession. Um, so you are kind of unique in that um, you, you, sp you spend a lot more time in some other sort of projects that don't look a lot like research, don't look a lot like academia. And of course you're very firmly grounded in what we think of as social work tech. So can you tell me about some of those other projects and interests that you've been working with? Well, yeah, I've actually, you know, bef not necessarily, uh, well, don't let me trip on my thoughts because you can just clarify me. <laughs> but uh, some of the projects I've been involved with over the years, how I got into technology was when I was at the hospital. Uh, and before that even, actually I've, I've, tech has followed me around my whole life and I just did learn to embrace it. Um, I think I might've mentioned once or twice in various formats, people get tired of me telling the story that I've always believed social work should embrace technology not because it's a thing we're doing now because it also exists in the future. And when I worked at the hospital, one of the first things I was told because I was working, I was very fortunate to be given an office but the office only had like the usual things, pens, pencils, blah, blah, blah. And I had a, I had a supervisor say, well, you know, we're not, we're not push button people. We're, we're, you know, we're people, people, you know, pushing buttons is somebody else's thing. That, that's just a bad paradigm, right? That's just a, that's just a, and that's, and I, and I empathize with that because when you think about automation and so forth, there's a lot of concern behind that, that might re reinforce the status quo. So I always looked at it from the perspective of, well, we should really be embracing tech for all sorts of reasons because first of all, it's a thing that is. And in, our, in, our, in my original, in my early work, 
you know, they were they were converting handwritten notations to computer stuff, so going into databases and things like that. Um, the the electronic medical record, the EMR, that uh, we take it for granted now, but that was a relatively exciting new field back in 2001, 2002, when I started kicking off my role. And there was a lot of pushback from, from people at the time, like, I don't want to, why would I, why would I type when I could write? Um, so I really thought that was important. And I learned along the way that, you know, that makes, you know, ex, you know, access to information changes the game. And that means patients could see records more easily, which of course now is part of the, you know, the thing. and actually in Iowa now it's a law where patients are able to, should be able to access all their records. I think that includes social work, which changes the tone of how we write, which is just a new change of the tone of how we think, um, because who's the audience for who you're writing for. Um, so, I mean, if you're asking me how I got into technology, it was from those practical steps along the way of like, this is something that we need. And of course now we're in this pandemic. So I don't have to sit here and, and make the case for things like what we're doing right now here because this is how we connect to people. Uh, this is how we do our work. You know, This is how we're keeping ourselves safe and each other safe. While at the same time, we have to acknowledge that there's a lot of inequity. So we have people who can't necessarily access this equipment or sit in front of someplace or have the wherewithal to do it. And that's something that, is, that, it, that social workers need to respond to as well. So I got into all of that. Uh, and then I got into my current position because they saw me doing that kind of work at the University of Hospitals. And they said, well, we need somebody in distance education who has a has a sense of technology, has a sense of how we're gonna bridge that and make that forward. So there was a whole practical reason for bringing me into the school of social work. But uh, I was, I wanted to say, as long as I'm here, let me build that focus. Let me contribute something to the, to whether you wanna call it the academic or the professional uh, field in some way that speaks to technology and social work. I, I joined and was a part, part of um, the hashtag macro SW component of that Mac I, think, I never, it never, I never, I never could remember if it was a consortium or collaboration, what we called ourselves. We just had that one, they had that name, hashtag macro SW, and it was Twitter chatting. And uh, it seemed so simple at the same time, but it was a really, for me, it was really exciting because that's how we met. That's how you could create a network on a social media platform. And it was, it was, it was a great way to connect. It was controversial. It was like, we learned things and we find, learn from each other. And I'm like, this is, this is the, this is the way. This is the way. I mean, there's a whole community there that doesn't exist where I'm on the ground right now. I have to, I have to take it, take advantage of that. Yeah, that's how I found all of you through hashtag SW Tech. So, mm -hmm. the, yeah, the huge and meaningful because I, yeah, my experience is that often you are the only person in your agency or at your location who's really interested in those types of things. And so, I think that type of connection is really essential to, you know, nurturing those types of ideas and being able to bounce them off somebody else. So I, I think that's huge. And so I'm, I'm glad that all of you, I, I think Melanie's the one who's given credit for um, starting um, SW Tech, but I'm really grateful that all of you started moving things in that direction. Yeah, I think, you know, it's hard to know when, you, you know, that's the thing about this type of organic engagement is I, I'm with you. I think Melanie started, Melanie Sage uh, started that. I think <laughs> it's hard to know. I'm going with it. It sounds right. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I'm really grateful for her too, because you're asking about projects now. I actually, I retired from macro social work as a project like last year, partly because among other things, I was just, I was doing more with my program here at Iowa and I had to make room for that. I had to carve out more time. And uh, she didn't, so Melanie invited, invited me this year to help them with a new project for uh, what I believe is known as iHeart Tech, which is an online, online peer-reviewed journal. I'm so excited and about this. I want to hear more. So I should well, probably stop interrupting you so you can tell me. <laughs> well, I'm probably getting away from your questions. I'm no, not no, I I'm totally just, want to hear about this. My brain is just, that's how it works. And why I, for years, what I found exciting about that is, I look, I remember when I was in starting out in social work in 2000, and you have to understand, when I say starting out, I mean, I know what it is. I'm embracing it, and I'm going to be a part of it. And so I put money down as a student to join the NASW uh, national organization. They, they, um, they started sending me paper journal. Like they don't do it anymore, but they had their journal, social work journal. And they would get it in the mail. I'm like, this is like a real thing that's happening where I get to read research being done in the field. And that was one of the exciting things is like, we're not just making it up. This is, this is, this is, a, this is part of it. You know, this, this whole idea of how we analyze and understand the world around us. But what we all know, I think the big big issue with journals is that they take a long time to get stuff in, right? They take a long time to get reviewed. The review is not, the review process can be kind of daunting. It's it's kind of a headache. And then at the same time, by the time stuff hits hits the publication, you know, the life, life is moving on, you know, maybe things are different now. Now I'm being really, really simplistic, 
trust me. Um, I'm sure that my research, my research colleagues are like, yeah, we get it. <laughs> this is nothing, you're not telling us anything new. Um, and yet we live in this world. Uh, so what I thought was exciting about the project that I didn't start, but Melanie, along with Laurel in uh, Alabama, uh, they came together to create this online peer review journal, which I thought this has got to be the wave of where we're going next because, and, and it isn't just that this is a platform to publish in that space, um, but it also uh, speaks to how practitioners, like I think you said the word that she was using was, um, what was the word she was using? Pracademics. Uh, Pracademics, yeah, right. I love this word. <laughs> yeah, I, I just learned it this morning, but I think that that's a bit of the spirit right, of this is like, you, you've got people who are practical. Like when they offered to bring me on as a part of that project, I'm like, well, you understand I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a tenure track. You know, I, I've got all of these like, ish, you know, these like, I've got these concerns, right? You understand that I'm not the thing. Like our, if you have students, you have students, um, you might know that they don't necessarily differentiate between who's doing what. I mean, I had students in, in, in my program and I didn't know, who, I, did, I, had, I had instructors, should say, when I was a student. And I didn't necessarily differentiate all the time from tenure track and clinical and adjunct. You know, I just figured this is the person teaching the class. They must know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but as a, in this role, when I was brought in, I was, I'm clinical. Like I don't, have a, I don't have a doctorate. I don't have any of that. Someday, who knows? I don't know. But uh, I'm coming straight out of practice. And uh, I have a license to that effect or whatever you want to call it. And even then I'm like, these, you know, there's a lot of back and forth, like the letters, who cares? You know, what do you know? How, what is your experience? And what is that? What, how do you cultivate that to make it meaningful for other people? I do see this project, our iHeart Tech is being a part of that, where we will create and publish online work that's being done, not just by a singular track of folks, but by people who are, who are across the spectrum in social work tech. Yeah, I love this. I think that's so important. And no, knowing all of you, I, it, it just makes sense um, that this is the direction that um, that you would be taking. And I, I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens with it next. Um, well, we just, you know, I just got into the got into it. <laughs> so um, I really do want it to be a success. And that's, that's, I said yes to it, knowing full well, it'll be a commitment. But at the same time, you know, it isn't just a blog, right? Or nothing's just anything. Sorry, I know this is going on a blog. So um, that's not okay. that's not the intent. I think what I'm saying, let me tell you why I'm saying that. Because I was talking about this with a, with a student a while back, like a couple of years ago. And I said, you know, what's really exciting, this idea of peer reviewed online journals through blogs. And she's like, well, blogs, they've been around for 20 years. I'm like, I know, but this is, we're talking about, this is how we will be publishing and communicating with each other. Mm -hmm. And And honestly, I already, it's already happening. By no means is this a new concept. Um, I think you're going to interview Ellen at some point. I don't I know, hope so. but uh, even if you're not, she actually um, she writes or she writes a, she's been writing a tech blog on her own. Mm -hmm. And I was reading a textbook the other day or last she said last year, and it cited her blog post. Mm -hmm. There it is. You know, she had some great ideas. She's a, she's a futurist. She's a visionary, and all she had to do was just blog about it. You know, mm -hmm. and that resonated. You know, she she had a sense of where she was going. Um, mm -hmm. So. Or what she was thinking. So I really appreciated that. So, you know, this is the world we live in. Is there a timeline for the project? Like what can we expect and when can we expect it? Or is that not to be known yet? It, it it's it's gonna unfold, I think, over time because there's a way we have to think about, you know, and this is everything I've learned from Macro SW and other projects. Um, I'll talk about one more in just a second here, mm -hmm. but it's all about like we do it, but we also want to promote it. We also want to evaluate is it if it is it is it meaningful? Uh, how can we adapt to it? Those are all things that are going to get squared away in terms of, I mean, I, for all of my free flowing, I'm thinking of this and thinking of that. Um, I do need to write this down. I do need to kind of map out a, a plan for it, which is part of the process that's happening right now. Um, and be, and be respectful for the, the, the creators who have brought this to bear. So I'm, I'm with them as well. So it should be something within the academic year that you'll, that you'll start to see things. Let me, let me be as general as specific as I can without putting myself into a corner. I'm like, oh, well, I said this and then oops. And then. <laughs> That's excellent. I'm really looking forward to seeing how it evolves. And then I think you just mentioned another project. I have one more project, which is coming from the school. And that has more to do with just finally living out the stream of doing a, a podcast that represents the School of Social Work at University of Iowa. We just launched the first episode a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, a little story there is that the University of Iowa has run this it's very strange. If you know anything about big universities or big, you know, public universities, they don't, you know, units, they all work together in some way that's meant to be cohesive. He said out loud. And, uh, but back in the seventies, the university of Iowa school of social work 
happened to have an extra couple of rooms in its in its unit space and they opened up a coffee shop and they opened up a coffee shop on their own you know it wasn't university sanctioned quote unquote um, but it was a place because they were looking for a way to employ a gentleman who had recently been deinstitutionalized guy's name is bill sactor and they brought him in because he has all this experience having been institutionalized and he was in this space now um, living in Iowa. There's a whole story of which the podcast goes through. If anybody is old enough, they might remember Mickey Rooney playing his character, Bill Sector, on, in a TV movie back in the early 80s. And that was a real story. And it involves the program that I work for, the University of Iowa School of Social Work. Uh, cut to now, uh, obviously, Bill passed away a number of years ago. The coffee shop has remained. But we're now realizing we need to shift focus on that space. So the podcast represents this shift where we're going to have this be an open space now for students to do different types of projects that involve technology. And this has been something I've been dreaming of for a while now, too. So it's starting to finally slowly take, take, uh, take shape. Uh, the pandemic has really thrown us into a bit of a tailspin because it was meant to launch last year. And the coffee shop, that space has been closed for a year because there's been nobody in the unit for a year. Everybody's been online. So it's happening this fall. So as I was saying earlier about uh, what we're trying to do, this is a refocusing based on what students have asked us. Students have come to us saying, what resources do we have beyond just the computer lab? Can we do project work? Can we create things? And the university has a kind of this and that spattering amount of stuff around the campus, but we want to do something specific to social work involving tech. So we're doing, fingers crossed that we launched that this fall. I think that sounds great. So please feel free to come back and talk about that later or send us more information oh, as, sure. as it starts to come about because I think that also sounds really important. Great. Um, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna probably do a couple more questions, but let's kind of, let's go back a little bit more to the script. I spent my whole life off script, but. Me too. <laughs> well, that's Me too. where all the good stuff is. Um, so let's talk a little bit about diversity in these types of spaces. Do you feel mm -hmm. that there, um, there is adequate representation? And if not, why not? How can we change it? Those types of things. That's an ongoing change. I mean, I think at the school that I'm at too, we're talking about this all the time. We're working on it all the time. Um, when you say, I mean, spaces is such a is such a generalized concept to me. Yeah, I was thinking I should break that down. I'm thinking specific, specifically um, uh, research because that's usually a question that I ask, but also mm -hmm. um, in in, play, in spaces where tech is being explored because um, in social work, um, a lot of that is really evolving as we're talking, right? Well, you know, it's interesting. All the leaders that I think of in social work tech um, represent the very thing I think you're talking about. Um, and I'm going to be blanking on all their names because one quirk about me is that I could I could tell you in, uh, all these exciting things, but if you ask me names, I'm like, Ooh. Um, and so um, I want to say it's like Professor Desmond Patton, mm -hmm. who I think is I forget what Columbia. Is Columbia, thank you. Of course, he's Columbia. Um, I follow him. Yeah. Uh, I think he's a he's he's a leader in that. Um, mm -hmm. And then the other person that comes right to mind is Dr. Fallon, and I can't think of her first name. And again, it's your, this is the part where I could have taken some notes before class. But is it Morgan? It's not Morgan. It's someone else. I, 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 this is ridiculous. Yeah, I keep watching this. I'm so, so sorry. Um, I can send you the link <laughs> to the information I'm talking about, Gina, just so you know. Okay. Uh, but uh, look, I, I think we've, we've got leaders in the field right now who are, you know, they're people of color. They're doing the work. You know, we, let's, let's recognize that. And they're, they're coming from that perspective. I interviewed her for a podcast for Macro SW that never, I, I apologize for this, we never got it out because um, there was never a sense of what that podcast was gonna be. And so it sat on my archive getting ready to be loaded and put out there. Um, so I, I'm confessing now that I apologize as I was going through my, my time wrapping up with them. It's like, oh, we never did launch this. Um, but we, she, did a, she did a chat with us and she blog posted and so forth, which I was grateful for. Yeah, I'm looking, um, I'm, I'm searching as you're doing this because I'm rude, but yeah, Morgan Fallon is a cinematographer. So. Mm -hmm. It wasn't yeah. Morgan. Um, I, I'll look it up too, um, because I know I've got it. Here. Well, we have the Google. <laughs> uh, but I, I would say, do you, if you're asking me, I'm just one person. Um, and by the way, uh, I think, uh, look at, uh, if you look at the, the, the Futures Fellowship that's going on right now mm -hmm. in, uh, you know, and that's coming from <laughs> names, names, Steve. Oh my gosh. I'm so embarrassed. If I would just write things down but ahead of time, I would be in so much fun. It Fallon is, Wilson. It's not Fallon. Dr. Fallon Wilson is the person. Okay. You know, oh, okay. She's the co-phone. There were black uh, hashtag Black Tech Futures uh, okay. Research Institute, National Black Tech and Ecosystem Association. She's out of Tennessee. Um, so there you go. And now there I'm looking. Go. Excellent. Okay. 
All right. So yeah, we do definitely have some leaders in these areas. My feeling is that it's still kind of few and far in between. Mm-hmm. Few and far in between. So how do we how do we encourage that? How do we? Um, and I think maybe this is the question I'll wrap with because I was trying to put this together in my mind as we were talking about this. Um, what advice do you have for people like me and like you who are academics? Um, and maybe you don't have that encouragement at your job site. Um, maybe um, you don't want to go back and you don't want to spend the money on a PhD or a DSW, but you feel like you have something that is important to contribute. So what encouragement can you give folks to sort of explore all of these new types of spaces and, and, and contribute something? I think that what we talked about earlier about at least getting finding where the networks are, which can be tough if you're not familiar. Like I said, for me, just dabbling on Twitter. I remember when Twitter started, I'm that old. And uh, I remember they were, you know, everything about tech at that time uh, in social media in particular, always felt like, let's be honest, it was like a bunch of white guys getting excited about white guy stuff. And so um, about uh, the TechCrunch blog and things like that, that uh, that's how I learned about platforms because that was where I was going to. But as I use Twitter, you know, Twitter evolved. And for all the things that we say, negative things about it, which are real, um, there's a community there that you can, you can connect with. And that's how I did it. Um, but I also learned that it's, it's a much more diverse space than the space I am physically geographically in. So that's where I had to look. And that's why I typically don't, I'm not very negative when it comes to social media from that perspective, because that's where I find diversity myself. That's where I find the voices. That's where I learn from people. And that's where I, you know, learned to be like, I'm not the expert just because I look, you know, that's the thing about being in tech as, as somebody who, like myself, it's, you know, all I had ever had to do growing up, this is a little story for you. One of the first jobs I ever had at the University of Iowa campus was being a custodian at the hospital. It paid well. I didn't know what else I could do at the time. You know, I knew how to do custodian stuff, not because it's easy, but because I was familiar with it. Mm-hmm. And so I, um, I was doing that work and I happened to mention to somebody that I was doing some work at a computer lab for school and they said, oh, get him up here because we just bought, you know, the custodial department just bought a computer and we want somebody to help us get it started. So they pulled me offline. I'm like, this is unheard of. I got to sit in front of a computer like for a week making spreadsheets. I'm like, this is, I was, I was a janitor, but I wasn't. But I don't know, you know, the thing of it is, is that there was an assignment to me. Like I suspect that oh, he's a young white male, of course, he's going to know these things. So there's that perception. I think people should always be sensitive to that. Um, that what is the perception? Because there may be a perception that this other person can't do those things. And so it being very simplistic again, but that's something that I've always tried to be very on alert for. What's this, what are you, are you doing work that, in, that encourages people to see you as somebody who is knowledgeable, or are you just being assumed as having that knowledge? Um, so when I went on Twitter and I started connecting with people, I realized I have a lot to learn, quite frankly, because there's lots of people out there already doing all this work. I can speak to it. I'm very fortunate, for example, to, I get to write a tech blog, for example, for, um, for a new social worker. Very grateful for that. And it speaks to my experiences. Everything I've talked about today, I've probably written in, the, in that blog at some point. But uh, it's finding, you know, kind of clicking into those hashtags like social work tech, SW tech, making those connections. Um, and then as I've, you know, it's evident that people have been starting making their own communities based on that too. So, um, and I'm trying to be respectful of that because not every space is a space I belong in, even if I like tech and I'm a social worker. So there's that too. So that's the big piece of the uh, big piece of suggestion. You don't have to, and, and honestly, the other thing I'll just say is I've already alluded to the fact that I feel like there's like, I need to be mindful of the, div- not the divide, but like in which lane I'm in as a clinical associate, you know, faculty member, I'm like, what lane am I in? You know, am, you know, what am I expected to do? And it's funny because at the University of Iowa in my program, they're like, oh, if you want to do research, that would be fantastic. You know, that, that's just like, that's, that's the great opening. But for me, I had to then find, you know, being a clinical faculty, non-tenured is, tenure track is a little different because tenure track have a whole kind of system, an ecosystem that starts from when they're PhD students and they learn, they have mentorships and they do that process. I didn't go through that. I went through a grad program, but it's a little different. So fortunately, the, the mentors I was able to identify and work with and publish with said, you know, don't, you know, one of the things that frees you in this exciting for you, Steve, is that you can do kind of anything you want from that perspective and you can focus on that and that can become your thing and you're not beholden to maybe some of those niche areas that other people are. Now, 
I'm not suggesting that's better because part of me thinks about, boy, if I took a different path, I could have had a great niche area I could have spoken to and written on and been like cultivating a whole reputation around. I didn't do that. I started in practice. I continue to engage in some relevant areas of practice while I do this work. I'm actually pretty proud of that. But mentorship, finding a good mentor or, you know, actually, and Dr. Lakea Cherry, who is, I think she's got her doctorate now from USC. And I'm, you know, again, she's in my cohort. Oh yeah. Isn't that exciting? You guys, yeah, she's one of my homies. <laughs> I, I look up to all of you because I, to this day, I'm like, gosh, I need to take it to the next level. You, you, you did all this work. Not everybody's going to be able to, and it's not for everybody though, right? Cause it's expensive. And there is a lot of discussion about that. Mm-hmm. And then not everybody wants to spend another two years or three years or five years in school and, and don't have the luxury because maybe there's children, family, someone else that you, you caretake, and it's just not going to be possible. So not everybody's going to be able to take that route. I, um, well, I bring her up because I went to one of her presentations at APM, I think it was actually in 2018. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were just talking about the, you know, those, those conferences. And she did this, she talked all about this thing that I thought was really great. Find, you know, I've always thought of mentorships as being kind of one-on-one formal, like find a mentor, follow mm-hmm. them, listen to them. And she's like, no, do a board of directors, mm-hmm. identify people that you know, um, ask them if you, they'd be willing to participate in meeting with you and, you know, in helping you. But also you can identify people who don't know that, you know, you can just say, you go to people and like, this person's on my board, they don't know it, <laughs> but they, they, they are somebody <laughs> I look up to and speak to. And I make a point to reach out to them. Okay. And I really, res- I, re- I loved what she described in that. And actually mm-hmm. I just shared that this week with students in my, um, one of my seminars. So don't, don't think you got to do it a certain way. And this really opened up my idea. How do you, how do you, you know, enrich yourself, learn more, uh, get good insight, get good feedback. Uh, and this is one of those ways to do it. So I've always been, in, I've always been uh, grateful for her um, work, but her presentation, she's, yeah. she, by the way, for those, that, I'm sure that people know this, but she's also, I believe, the CEO of the, new, of the Network of Social, Rec- Social Work Management, yep. and, which is a great resource, by the way, a mm-hmm. thing to look forward to, look into. And I think they give out, I think they get, give, I think they have free resources like, to, to, to provide to you. And I think they're really helpful. So another, mm-hmm. another suggestion for everybody. Yeah, and there's some really cool fellowships and some other things. So it's definitely, if it's not something people have looked at, if you're if you're new to social work, and you're just kind of jumping into the pond. That's a really good place to start. So all sorts of really cool stuff there to look at. Mm-hmm. Okay, so anything I left out? Anything that you have a burning desire to say before I wrap up? Uh, I think I've covered it. I I I, I don't want to bore people <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> and I want and I also apologize. Like I said, I can never remember names. Um, I could sit here and remember talking to you. And then and you asked me, so what was my name again? I'm like, oh, oh, shoot. Um, it's Gina. See, there's red is it's right that way. But uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I just want to say thanks for inviting me to have this conversation. Well, thanks to, thanks for coming up on a Saturday morning and having the conversation with me. I really appreciate it. All right. Well, we'll lock off and then we'll see you next time on Rigorously Relevant. <laughs>